So once again, it's a great pleasure to uh, host uh, uh, you all in Thermal Transport Cafe to listen to Mirko Gallo, who's a, a research scientist, I believe, in the University of La Sapienza in Roma. Am I wrong, Mirko? Yeah, yeah. You're right. Okay. I'm right. Uh, Mirko will talk about uh, uh, very, very, very interesting work he has been, uh, um, say, uh, conducting and research on uh, the uh, nanoscale and, uh, say, up to microscale phenomena of nucleation, and that can uh, explain, uh, uh, in, say, important observation uh, uh, made on experiments. Okay, I will, um, I will keep it short in the interest of time and, and give you the floor, Mirko, and thank you again for, uh, for joining us. Thank you very much, Matteo. <clears throat> okay, let me share the screen. <clears throat> okay, can you see my screen? Okay, good morning or good evening, everybody, depending on the time zone you are. I am Mirko Gallo, and first of all, let me say thank you, the organizer, for inviting me here. Uh, to talk to you about my research activity in uh, mesoscale modeling of nucleation and boiling. Okay, so uh, let me first of all also uh, say thank you to all of my co-workers, starting from uh, Francesco Magaletti, with whom I have worked extensively in this uh, problem, starting from my PhD. And I would say that Francesco Magaletti was, for me, a sort of sparring partner in the phase transition class led by Carlo Massimo Casciola. And I want to say thank you to Carlo Massimo, that was my supervisor during my PhD, and uh, also my mentor. And uh, I'm still working with him here in, uh, in Sapienza. And uh, I'm still working uh, with Daniele and uh, Occhioni, that are two PhD students in our group. And the last but not the least, let me say thank you to Marco Marengo, Joel Deconic, and Tassos Georgolas, that are uh, with which we have a very uh, amazing collaboration in which we are trying to apply our methodologies to thermal science problems. Okay, I, I want to start with this very nice video. I want to share with you some comments on this video regarding the metastability of water, uh, of superheated water. So let me show you the video and then I, I will comment on. <clears throat> Sorry for the noise, but this is due to the YouTube video. Okay, so this is a typical example of explosive boiling in which we have a jug containing water that is heated in a microwave home. And as you can see, this water is removed from the microwave and it is gently placed in a thing. And nothing happens because despite the very high temperature, the liquid is the, the water is still in the liquid states. But if we pour uh, a spoon of uh, coffee inside the water, the, the, the water stops boiling very suddenly and in an explosive wave. And uh, let's say, I think that this is the, the quintessence of the boiling complexity. Because in order to understand this kind of problem, we need to play with uh, uh, um, a plenty of physical uh, of, uh, of physical context like metastability, phase transition, thermally activated projects at, uh, at the hand also, the rich fluid dynamics involved in multi-phase flow. So there are critical questions that we can discuss today about this uh, phenomenon that are, why does this happen? And uh, what are the, time, the spatial scales that are very important to characterize this problem, or which are the typical transition times uh, given at fixed thermodynamic uh, condition for the system to be transformed in vapor. And uh, at the end, if we can control this process at, at the limit, we can engineer these processes. So I think this could be the, let's say, the main core of, of the talk. And about the last question and about engineering, there is this very nice sticker on the microwave wall that are uh, very nice because it seems that the microwave oven manufacturers saying us how to control 
and how to avoid the late boiling by putting a glass, a spoon inside the glass containing water. Okay, so uh, why these issues are very important? So these issues are very important for a plenty of uh, disciplines, starting from the multiphase fluid mechanics, because probably this is the missing link in fluid mechanics be between a domestic simulation and uh, fluid mechanics of multiphase flow. So the way the new phase originates in a liquid, or this is also the case for condensation of a vapor. And this is also very important for uh, thermal science because the onset temperature, for example, for boiling and transition are very important for thermal transport processes. But from a fundamental point of view, this is also very interesting from in statistical physics and in particular in statistical mechanics aiming at characterize the phase transition pathways, both in equilibrium and in non-equilibrium context. And there are also other disciplines that are very interested in nucleation, like chemistry, applied mathematics, material science, biology, and so on. So from an applicative point of view, uh, this is also very important for two-phase cooling of uh, high-power electronics, for the boil-off controls of cryogenic fluids in space mission, for power generation in steam flower plant, the salination process, and so on. So this is very important. But clearly today, uh, due to my expertise, I'm going to discuss the nucleation process and in particular, the role of metastability and uh, thermal fluctuation in characterized nucleation and its multi-scale nature, the need for mesoscale model to understand this process, and uh, finally, the coupling with the hydrodynamics and some numerical techniques as well as rare event techniques to characterize this process. So let me start from the phase transition generality. So here we have a typical diagram for fluid in which we have in this point here, the, the liquid states. So basically we can obtain vapor in this, case, in, uh, in this case by increasing the temperature up to the boiling point and up to the boiling point, sorry. And this is called boiling or by decreasing the pressure at the constant temperature in this part here. And this is called cavitation. So this kind of picture is oversimplified because it doesn't take into account the role of metastability. In fact, here I am reporting the typical uh, form of the pressure function as a function of the density for different temperature. And if we start from the blue curve here and we fix one value of the pressure, so we, we are doing an isobaric transformation in the in the fluid, it's uh, not difficult to realize that if we increase the, the temperature, like in this case here, we are stretching the liquid because at constant pressure, the density of the liquid is decreasing. And this is the reason why one liquid becomes metastable. And we can identify the saturation region in which we have the, the equality from the pressure on the vapor and the liquid states, and also the same for the chemical potential, that is the red point. And the, the, the spinodal condition, that is this one, that is the entering point in the unstable thermodynamic region. And if we repeat this kind of uh, <clears throat> argument for a, a plenty of pressure and temperature, we end up with this curve here, in which we have the red curve that is called saturation curve, and this one that is called spinodal. So all the paths here inside between the saturation curve and the spinodal are the typical boiling process. And so I want to discuss uh, with you what, what is happening at a domestic scale if we leave a system to fluctuate in, in this region here, in the metastable region. So basically here we have this very nice numerical simulation, this anatomistic simulation of a Lennard-Jones fluid. And I am reporting here the typical dimension of the system that are more or less 300 nanometers as a length, a, a huge number of particles that is roughly uh, half a billion, and the typical time scale that is one nanosecond. And if we run the simulation in this case, this has been done by the group of the Tanaka in. Uh, Switzerland, it seems that there are some bubbles inside. So the system spontaneously decomposes in two phases, the liquid and this void zone that we call nanobubbles. Okay. And I, I want also to share with you some, uh, let's say, comments on the typical computational cost of this kind of simulation. I am not an expert in atomistic simulation, but we can do 
a back of the envelope calculation based on the typical atomistic curves for equilibrium simulation. And this is roughly, <clears throat> let's say, million of core hours. Okay, so this is a, a very important simulation because this is a real picture of nucleation at the nanoscale, but it's very computational expensive. Okay. And so uh, we can also identify the <clears throat> which are the relevant parameters for the nucleation. And for sure, the most important one is the energy barrier that separates the liquid that wanna be a, a, a vapor. Okay. And so in order to understand this process, I think that classical nucleation theory is very important because in classical nucleation theory, uh, we are trying to evaluate the work needed to form a bubble in a liquid, okay? And so and this work accounts for, sorry, for two different contributions. The first one is the, the work done by the pressure to form this sphere. So we are under the hypothesis that we are a spherical uh, symmetry. So we are uh, dealing with a sphere and there is a, uh, a sharp, uh, mathematical discontinuity between the liquid and the vapor, and we have a surface tension because we have a bubble, okay? And so if we look at the, uh, uh, I don't see the, the color, okay, just a moment, okay, at the red term here, that is the interfacial energy, and the green here that I highlighted with this term here, there is a competition between the force that is scaling with the, the energy that is scaling with the volume and the energy that is scaling with the area. And so we have an energy barrier. This energy barrier can be identified by imposing that the energy, uh, the derivative of the energy is zero. And we end up with these two important physical observables that are the critical radius and the critical energy. And so if we define the nucleation rate as the number of supercritical bubbles that are in this region here, uh, normalized with the volume and, and the time, we end up with the nucleation rate. And there are some, let's say, theoretical prediction like this one provided by Zeldovich that relates the nucleation rate with the energy barrier. So the more is the energy barrier, the more, let's say, is the time to be waited to form a bubble inside the system. Okay, so there are some problems with CNT in characterizing the nucleation process, and there are this very nice paper, this commentary paper in, uh, in PNAS that highlights the role of thermal fluctuation in uh, in uh, nucleation and in, in particular in CNT misprediction and also the curvature dependence of the surface tension, okay? And uh, so basically uh, in roughly five years ago, there has been an attempt to modify this uh, classical nucleation theory with a, a sort of corrected CNT by Mansell et al. This is the very nice paper in which the CNT has been coupled with the uh, Rayleigh really, say overdumped dynamics and uh, the surface tension uh, dependence on the interface radius uh, is taken into account by using the Tolman correction. And it seems that this kind of CNT is very predictive, but uh, predictive, but the problem is that the Tolman length is a no, so it must be taken from, uh, for example, from atomistic simulation from molecular dynamics. And there is also the problem that CNT does not provide a vanish barrier at the spinal level. And so, yeah, uh, <clears throat> CNT for sure is a very uh, important uh, tool to identify the, at the qualitative level nucleation. But if we want to be predictive, of nucleation, as for example, thermal science required, we need to do something that is different. So in order to uh, highlight the main important feature to characterize nucleation, I want to discuss with you a toy model that is, uh, let's say, characterizing nucleation. So uh, let's imagine uh, that we have uh, a free energy of the system with another parameter. And if we have in mind the CNT, this could be, for example, the Gibbs energy as a function of the radius of the bubble. And let's suppose that we have this form here. 
So we start from the liquid states, that is this one, and we have that from a thermodynamical point of view or from a mechanical point of view, these are metastable states because we have that this is a local minimum for the free energy. There is also another point that is very important, that is this subtle point here, that is uh, a transition state in which we have the critical bubble, and then we have the more stable state that is a Weber, okay? And so we can imagine that our thermodynamic system, so our liquid, is like uh, a random work trapped in a metastable basin. So it fluctuates around uh, its equilibrium position due to the thermal fluctuation uh, that arises from the that arises from the matter granularity. And when we have a rare event able to overcome this barrier, we end up with the phase transformation. So statistical mechanics uh, give us the probability of observing uh, a configuration in terms of a value of hex in this case and a value of energy. Uh, in this way here, sorry. And so uh, this is uh, related to the exponential of the energy deviation with respect to the minimum value. And uh, there is a very famous theory uh, in this case that is called Kramer's theory that give us the frequency of the barrier passing here that is called Kramer's theory, I mean. And this frequency is related to the energy barrier. Okay, so this uh, toy model is very important because it, it highlights which are the very important ingredients in characterized nucleation. So first of all, we need to have some thermodynamics that is able to uh, do that is able to describe the stability. Then we should have thermal fluctuation inside the whole model because they are responsible for the nuclei formation, nuclei, and, and then some hydrodynamics for the nuclei expansion finally reaching the stable state that is the Weber. And so uh, this highlights also the multi-scale nature of the phenomenon because nucleation, despite its origin is at an atomistic scale as a rare event, it develops in a complex non-equilibrium process towards the stable states. So we need these physical ingredients, the statistical mechanics of thermal fluctuation, and this, let's say the microscopic world with the einstein boltzmann theory of fluctuation. A mesoscopic world that is the thermodynamics of two-phase system, like, for example, density functional theory of Van der Waals theory. And on the end of the day, we should have also the coupling with the macroscopic hydrodynamics like Navier-Stokes equation. And the question is, can all this information coexist in a single holistic description? And this was, uh, let's say, the, the mathematical model I want to discuss with you today. So one important problem is nucleation is that if we look at the typical dimension of the bubble, of the critical bubble, for example, in water at the ambient condition, we have that the, the critical radius is something like two or one nanometers. That is, let's say, in the same order of the interface thickness between liquid and bubble. So in interface, in uh, sorry, in nucleation, there is no scale separation between uh, the typical dimension of the bubble and the interface thickness. And for this reason, uh, we are adopting, uh, let's say, a diffuse interface approach in which the liquid and, and the bubble are separated by an interface with finite thickness. This is the Van der Waals theory that for the purpose of uh, addressing also heterogeneous nucleation here has been augmented with uh, an energy that accounts the interaction between liquid and solid. Uh, and so this is the free energy of the system in which we have the energy of the bulk here is the Helmholtz free energy that is basically related to the equation of state. These terms here, these are squared gradient terms that accounts for, uh, let's say, penalize the interface formation. So this plays a role of a sort of interface uh, of surface tension. And then we have one Lagrange multiply to enforce the mass conservation. And this term here, that is the, the free energy of the world. And so uh, the equilibrium of this, uh, of this guy is given uh, when the first variation of this functional is zero. And so we end up with uh, an equation for the chemical potential that is this one, that is constant, uh, that is this Lagrange multiplier here, that is the, 
uh, let's say the chemical potential at equilibrium at this boundary condition here that is relating the energy at the wall the interaction between solid and liquid with the derivative of the density okay it's not difficult to to prove that this kind of model is able to provide uh the in a natural way the interface of the liquid vapor surface tension and here i am comparing the diffuse interface prediction with some leonard uh, john's uh, atomistic simulation bank benchmark data and also the wettability of the world that enforce when the system has two phases the macroscopic contact angle so basically this is the the definition of the interfacial density that is also let's say the generalization of the angle of loss law for the surface tension okay and this is the thermodynamics of the system and we need to couple this thermodynamics with the navier stokes equation so basically here we have the the balance for mass momentum and internal energy that basically is the difference between the most common uh, evolution for the for the total energy that is conserved in navier stokes dynamics minus the kinetic energy and due to the, the diffuse interface approach, we have this new term here that is highlighted in red that uh, accounts for capillarity uh, in the system. So we can play with, uh, with the equation. In particular, we can take this guy and we can differentiate with respect to time. And uh, I, I won't really want to skip all the, the calculation. We end up with an equation for the entropy evolution. And this entropy evolution basically accounts for one uh, entropy flux and one energy production that due to the clausius theorem inequality or the second law of thermodynamics uh, must be definite positive. And this gives us the explicit form that are thermodynamically consistent for the stress tensor sigma and the energy flux. And uh, if we compare this guy with the typical Navier-Stokes uh, stress tensor, it's not difficult to realize that here there is a sort of distributed capillarity that naturally take into account the surface tension that only depends on the capillary coefficient that is univocally determined by the surface tension of the fluids. And these terms also uh, is present in the energy flux. So this is the uh, entropy production, and it's not difficult to realize that it is a positive function. Okay. So uh, the second uh, element is the thermal fluctuation at the continuum level. And uh, in order to do, to do that, we have generalized what has been done by Einstein and the Landau with the fluctuating dynamics uh, to the world of, let's say, diffuse interface. So uh, in a nutshell, we have that the equilibrium thermal fluctuation are related to the entropy deviation with uh, its... Uh, maximum value. This is true for a system in which the energy is conserved, the number of particles, sorry, that the mass of the system and the volume of the system. So we have to use the, the constrained entropy, as in this case, that can be expressed in terms of the fluctuation that are the deviation of the fields, density, velocity, and temperature with respect to the equilibrium volume. And so the equilibrium condition has done in the previous case for the energy and for these two Lagrange multipliers that are basically uh, the chemical potential again and the temperature. And the probability distribution for the fluctuation uh, takes this form. This is called Einstein-Boltzmann probability distribution for the macroscopic fluctuations. And so if we are under the hypothesis that this fluctuation is small with respect to the mean value, and this is true in, uh, in fluid dynamics because, I mean, the thermal fluctuation also at, at metal scale is small with respect to the mean value of the, of the fields, we can do a second order expansion for the, for the functional and we end up with a, with a second order approximation of the entropy that provide us uh, this very nice integral. This is called PAT integral. The reason why this is called PAT integral, this is called PAT integral for uh, in the community of physics and in functional integral for a mathematician. But basically, uh, this guy that has been introduced by Richard Feynman is uh, the generalization of a multidimensional integral in infinite dimension in which we are uh, 
summing on all over the possible trajectory uh, in the fields that are the function that are describing for us thermal fluctuation. And this is, there is, I, I really don't want to enter in the mathematical detail, but I want to share with you this very nice uh, cartoon that ironized on our life as a trajectory between birth and death with all the different declinations. Okay, so the formula, uh, I have uh, some concern about this formula, but forget about, okay? So it's very nice, just the cartoon. Okay, so uh, when the fluctuations are small, we have that the entropy deviation, that the entropy is a quadratic formula, so we have a Gaussian path integral that is the only path integral we are able to solve analytically. And in particular, if we do that by applying some, uh, let's say, uh, statistical mechanical machinery, we end up with the, uh, the typical correlation function of the correlation tensor for the fluctuating fields. And we can say that the, the temperature is delta correlated in space. So this is a Dirac delta function. And this is also the case for, uh, for the velocity. But since we have capillarity in the system, density fluctuations are not delta correlated anymore. And so there is a typical correlation lens here that is related to the capillarity or if you want to the surface tension. Okay, so, and the question is, how can we connect the world of multiphase flow with the theory, with the Einstein-Boltzmann theory of thermal fluctuation? So basically we are going to add the noise inside the Navier Stokes equation as done by, originally by Landau uh, in the last century by using a fluctuation dissipation theorem. So here we have the balance for mass, momentum, and the energy with these new terms here that are highlighted in blue that are stochastic forces. So since the fluctuations are, are small, as I say, uh, we can uh, linearize the Navier-Stokes equation around uh, some uh, equilibrium configuration that I call the U0, and we end up with a linear system with this guy here that is the hydrodynamic operator. So, uh, and we can also define these stochastic forces as Gaussian processes uh, that are delta correlated in time and which are typical correlation in space that is the result of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So, the delta correlation in time is basically related to the fact that uh, there are in the system there are some conserved quantities like momentum and density and energy that are slow. Uh, quantities and uh, some very fast uh, variables that are noise. And so there is a scale separation between the typical time of thermal fluctuation that is on the on the time scale of picoseconds and the typical time of the response of the hydrodynamics. And so for, for, uh, for this reason, we can assume that th these fluxes are delta correlated in time. So since now the system of equation is linear, we can write the let's say um, the mild solution that is the fundamental solution for the problem like this and we can play in order to identify the correlation tensor and so if we require that the correlation tensor that arises from fluctuating aerodynamics is the same as the one provided by the einstein boltzmann theory we end up with the fluctuation distribution theorem that gives us the four of this stochastic noise that at the end of the day are Gaussian processes with the divergence here, because they are, let's say, associated with conservative quantities. And uh, they are Gaussian process with the zero mean and correlation given by the fluctuation distribution balance. Okay, so here I am uh, reporting the all the thermodynamic fluxes in terms of deterministic that are the red and black terms and the stochastic one. Okay, so uh, we use this equation to characterize nucleation. And I, I want to show you the result of the first simulation that is cavitation in which we have a fluid that is at rest. And we have this land here that is 200 uh, nanometers, 250 nanometers, sorry. And the typical observation time is one microsecond. There are uh, uh, this number of cells, and this is the typical cost in core hours that is very, very slow. So basically, we can run this simulation with uh, on our laptop. Okay, 
and uh, I am reporting the the density field, so the ISO contour, the ISO surfaces with the density in uh, taken as one value in the interface, probably this is the critical one. Okay, and as you can see, thermal fluctuation as in molecular dynamics uh, tends uh, lead the system to spontaneous decompose in uh, two phases. But since now we have a mesoscale model coupled with the Navier-Stokes equation, we are able to follow not only the nucleation phase, but also the expansion of this bubble. So let's say the macroscopic motion with coalescence and uh, all that arises from the hydrodynamics. This was, uh, let's say, a, a free space simulation in which the box is three periodic. And we have done the same for uh, heterogeneous nucleation, in which here we have a system that has two walls, two solid smooth walls on the Z direction here and there. And as you can see, the bubbles now start forming on the walls. So, and uh, if we count the number of bubbles in order to identify the most important uh, uh, nucleation observable, we have that the number of bubbles in time starts increasing almost linearly, like in this case here. And if we take the slope of, the, of this curve here and we normalize this slope uh, with the volume of the system, we end up with the nucleation rate. And I want to comment you two very important uh, facts that, that, that are connected to cavitation. So basically, we have here the nucleation rate as a function of the density. That means the nucleation rate as a function of the metastability of the system. And here we have some comparison with molecular dynamics, the simulation I was showing you uh, before. And uh, the, the, let's say the agreement is very, is very good. And this is the first results. And also we have the scaling here of the nucleation rate as compared for hydrophilic and hydrophobic surfaces when dealing with heterogeneous nucleation. And also in this case, we recover the scaling of the, CN, the, scaling of the CNT, and uh, uh, namely for hydrophobic walls, the, the number of bubbles is, is greater with respect to hydrophilic ones. So unfortunately, we, we have no uh, results in molecular dynamics up to the best of our knowledge. I mean, we have no molecular dynamics results on this kind of system to compare these, uh, these results. Okay, uh, and then uh, we have applied this kind of machinery also to the boiling simulation. Here, there are some technical problem related to the fluctuating aerodynamics on open system, but uh, I mean, if you are interested in this aspect, we can discuss uh, uh, later on. Okay, so basically here we have uh, a liquid that is at saturation. We are imposing the pressure with the radiative boundary boundary condition, and we are imposing a lead flux. So uh, I have this system here that has now uh, the typical length of one micron and uh, the typical time scale of microseconds, and we use roughly uh, 10 to the power seven uh, cells. Um, okay, so the typical uh, simulation computational cost of this simulation is uh, 10, uh, is uh, 1,000, sorry, core hours. So that is, again, can be uh, run on, uh, let's say, on a laptop. And this is the result. So basically, this is the bubble formation due to the heating. So we are doing an isobaric transformation in these fields. And we can say that the some bubbles start spontaneously forming on the wall. And we end up with this, let's say, layer due to the boundary condition that are periodic. OK? And uh, OK, we, uh, we have addressed the problem of uh, nucleated bowling with this kind of uh, machinery. And so basically here I am reporting the snapshot of different simulation for hydrophob hydrophilic, sorry, the first one, and hydrophobic surfaces. And here we have the normalized temperature with respect to the, the difference between the saturation temperature and the spinodal uh, as a function of the wettability. So if we follow one of this curve, we can say that at, uh, at the beginning, the temperature starts increasing, like in this case here, up to one point when some bubbles start forming, 
and then the temperature starts decreasing due to the latent heat. And then when we end up with the, the, the vapor slab, the, the, the temperature starts increasing again, as in this case. And if we identify as the onset temperature, the maximum, the first maximum of this curve, we can say that this is a monotonic function of the contact angle. It means that the anticipation of the boiling is evident when dealing with hydrophobic surfaces. And another very interesting fact is that if we uh, repeat these experiments for different value of the imposed flux, we recover that the onset temperature depends on the intensity of the heat flux. That is, I, I mean, very known from, uh, from experiments. But this is, let's say, a signature of the non-equilibrium nature of boiling. And, uh, OK. Since uh, the wettability seems to be a relevant role in uh, in this kind of system, we have played with uh, some defects. And they are not geometrical defects, but let's say they are chemical defects in the sense that the, wood, the, the white part of the wall is hydrophilic and the blue one is hydrophobic. As, as you can see here, the bubble starts forming on the hydrophobic defect. And here I am reporting the the temperature of the wall with a perfect wall with not uh, chemical heterogeneities and uh, one uh, with uh, one defect, sorry. Okay, the blue is the curve with the defect and the red curve is the curve without, is the ultra smooth wall. And as you can see here, there is a, a strong anticipation of the boiling temperature uh, in the wall with one defect. And if we play with several defects here, we can try to uh, measure the temperature, the entire temperature on the wall. And as you can see, the temperature of the on the blue part here is higher with respect to the one on the on white. And uh, but if we text the wall, it seems that the the typical uh, temp the, the temperature of the entire wall is more or less constant. And another very important fact is that if we try to identify the nucleation rate of the process, that is the slope of the, of the curve that is counting in the number of bubbles formed in the, in the system, in this case, per unit time, but per unit surfaces, because this is a heterogeneous nucleation rate, we can say that the nucleation rate is only determined by the hydrophobicity of the wall. So we have different patches here, but the nucleation rate is always the same. OK. And uh, yeah, to conclude this part, fluctuating hydrodynamics and diffuse interface uh, that are a mesoscale model of, flu of, uh, uh, of fluids uh, describe nucleation from nucleation to hydrodynamics. And uh, for, for the case of cavitation, these rates have been validated against atomistic simulation. And uh, when applied to non-equilibrium conditions like boiling, fluctuating hydrodynamic diffuse interface uh, highlight the role of surface wettability in lowering the onset temperature on uh, ultra smooth surfaces. And that sparse hydrophobic nanometric patches are sufficient to trigger nucleation at low super heat. Another important thing, at least for me, that uh, I'm working, let's say, in, in nucleation, uh, the depends on the boiling temperature of the imposed flux are allied the non-equilibrium nature of nucleation in boiling that is very difficult to, to be addressed. Now, before discussing the last part of the, goal, of the talk that is uh, related to the rare event techniques in phase transition, I, I, I want to give you a background of this part. Sorry, I cannot... Okay. Okay. So here I am commenting the state of the heart of GPU accelerated codes for uh, addressing uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, system of equation like fluctuating hydrodynamics and diffuse interface. So fluctuating hydrodynamics and diffuse interface are very, uh, let's say, suitable for GPU accelerated codes because we are basically dealing with compressible hydrodynamics. So we can use a fully explicit numerical scheme. And so we can go very fast with this kind of uh, architecture. And at the state of the art, uh, we, we are developing uh, this software that's called Madness in Sapienza, together with uh, Francesco Battista, Paolo Guartieri, Marco Bussoletti, 
la riabbondanza me and uh, Carlo Massimo, uh, to, that is a GPU accelerated code that is able uh, to simulate a system that is of order of 1000 square, uh, sorry, uh, migrant to the power three for tens of uh, microseconds. Okay, but as you can see, uh, 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 we saw in the previous video, uh, often uh, uh, phase transition occur on the time scale of one second. And this is a, a very important point because what we can do in this case, we have to wait one second, so it's not possible to address the problem with brute force simulation. And so uh, for this reason, I, I want to discuss with you some very important Uh, techniques in statistical mechanics that are Correarian techniques. So basically, the let's say the the mother of this theory is the, a more general mathematical theory that is called the large deviation theory that give us some very important answer on uh, this mathematical problem. So let's suppose that we have a dynamical system like this that is perturbed by a small random noise. So basically, if you compare this structure here with the one of Navier Stokes or stochastic Navier Stokes equation, they are more or less the same, because this is the derivative with respect to time of, a, of one field, for example, density, velocity, and, uh, and energy. This is the nonlinear term of Navier Stokes, and, and this part here is the stochastic part of the Navier Stokes equation. So uh, the Friedman Benz and large deviation theory say us that we can define this action functional here, and we can say, okay, which is the trajectory, the most probable trajectory that is connecting the state U0 with the state U1? This is a mathematical problem, okay? And uh, large deviation theory say us that this trajectory is uh, proportional to the exponential of the action functional like this. So in order to infer the trajectory with the maximum probability, we have to minimize this functional here in terms of uh, time and space. So I, I want to stress that this is, let's say, a uh, functional in sense that U is a function of time as a function, uh, and a function of space. And this is the LDU squared norm with this matrix here. Okay. So now what is happening in nucleation? So basically we have that the state zero is the uniform liquid, the state one is the uniform vapor, and we want to characterize the most probable trajectory that is connecting liquid and vapor. And for sure, and this is not true uh, at all, for sure, let's suppose that we have no macroscopic fluxes. So uh, there is a transition state that is out in the static case, one bubble. And we are interested in characterize this trajectory here in the phase space. So now it's not difficult to realize that when there is no energy barrier, so the transition is spontaneous, we have that the trajectory from the, the critical bubble to the bubble is deterministic. And in this case, if we look at this functional here, the, mean, the absolute meaning of the functional is zero, and we end up with the, the typical deterministic trajectory in which this is u dot, sorry, u dot is equal to bu. And the function, the, the action is zero, so the probability is one. But what happens here? Because if we play, if we start in this position here without noise, the system is here again. And so this is a very rare trajectory. And so in order to characterize it, we have to minimize this constraint functional with this two condition here. And this is, let's say, very complex on Navier-Stokes dynamics, but uh, we, we can try to simplify a little bit, a little bit. We can try to simplify the, the system by using the free energy and by adopting, let's say, the gradient, the steepest descent dynamics. So basically, we, we can take the free energy of the system, of the liquid power system, and we can take the derivative with respect to time, and uh, we want to establish a, a dynamic such that this guy is always negative and zero in the equilibrium position. And so we can play. <clears throat> It's not difficult to realize that this dynamics here that is called gradient dynamics satisfy these inequalities. And if the dynamics in, is in this form here, we can show that the most likely path is the minimum energy path, 
because the two dynamics are the first, the deterministic dynamics that is going from the, the critical bubble to the viver, that is uh, the dynamics of the Stevens descent. And the other one that has another sign here that is plus, so we are going up on the, on the energy barrier, that is like the time reversed dynamics. And so instead of minimizing the, the action, we can minimize the energy, and this is very easy. And uh, if we have, uh, if we, we do so, we end up with transition probability that is related to the energy barrier. So now it's not difficult to realize that the, the, the nucleation rate is related to the transition probability with the prefactor. And so we recover the classical form for the nucleation rate. And here it's evident that in rare events, the energy barrier is, is higher. Otherwise, we can do a brute force, a, a brute force uh, uh, let's say, simulation. And then the refactor does not play a relevant role. OK, and uh, there is, uh, let's say, a, a very important machinery that is called string method that is able to minimize this problem. So instead of solving the time reversed dynamics, it deserves directly the minimum energy path. And basically, it's not difficult to realize that the minimum energy path is always is a curve in the configurational space like this that is always tangent to, to the gradient of the energy. And so basically, this means that if we isolate the orthogonal component of the, of the chemical potential here, and we minimize this as zero, we end up with the minimum energy path. And so there is this uh, very nice numerical techniques that is able to reproduce the minimum energy path. Okay, so what happens next? So we have the energy barrier as evaluated with the string method, and we know that the minimum energy path is also the most likely path for the transition within liquid and Weber. And uh, we want to characterize the nucleation process as a Poisson process. So basically, this is a, a Kolmogorov hypothesis on crystal dislocation. And uh, there are also some, uh, let's say, theoretical evidence on the grammar theory. This is true also for bubble nucleation. But nevertheless, we have done here a very large numerical simulation in uh, fluctuating aerodynamics. And we have identified all the bubbles that are nucleated in this case on a, on a wall, but this, this has been done also for homogeneous, uh, not only for heterogeneous nucleation. And if we construct the Voronoid oscillation around these points, we can characterize the probability distribution of the bubbles that are formed in the, in the fields. And we, we compare this kind of uh, probability distribution with the theoretical prediction that are the one of the random Poisson processes. And so it seems that nucleation, uh, also in also bubble nucleation, is a random Poisson bond process that is only characterized by the nucleation rate that is J here, that is only characterized for agar barrier as the let's say the energy barrier. And so let's suppose that we have a volume of the system like this and the time window of one second. And uh, we characterize the nucleation process as a random Poisson bond process. So basically, we have here the, the expected number of nucleated bubbles in this form. And so we can ask to identify the probability of observing at least one bubble in the field, that is this one. And we can say, OK, we define the cavitation pressure or the boiling temperature such that this transition pr probability is one half. And if we do that, we are able to identify the most probable nucleation temperature or the most probable nucleation pressure in the fields. And we, we have done that uh, at the beginning for, uh, for cavitation here, in which there are uh, these very nice, uh, these amazing experiments by the group of Coben, in which the cavitation pressure of poor water in poor seclusion has been uh, identified. And uh, there is now, let's say, a broad consensus about the fact that at the ambient condition, uh, poor water can sustain roughly minus, minus 120 megapascal. So we have applied our uh, <clears throat> machinery, uh, our 
uh, relevant techniques for a cavitation, and we have measured, we have estimated the cavitation presence on the entire range of temperature of the liquid states. And if we take this point here and we compare, it's this one, and we compare these results with the one of uh, Azuzzi, the group of Copen, we have the same value, and the arc the 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 agreement is also very good at higher temperature. Now. Uh, we are uh, trying to do the same with boiling, with superheated uh, fluids, cryogenic fluids. And uh, yeah, this is homogeneous nucleation. So the boiling temperature are very high. They are not so close to the spinodal temperature, more or less they are in the, in the middle. And we had this data from uh, this um, very nice experiments here in which, if I remember correctly, uh, these the points here are identified with isobaric eating uh, experimental techniques, and these one are vapor chambers. And we have compared our uh, theoretical prediction with, uh, with experiments. And also, in this case, it seems that there is a, a very good agreement. Uh, but let me stress again that this is, uh, let's say, uh, homogeneous nucleation for pure nitrogen and pure methane, so the, the boiling temperature are very high with respect to the one detected in most common experimental uh, cases. Okay, so I, I want to summarize this talk with a take-home message that is uh, that the, a proper modeling of nucleation is crucial for describing phase change and diffuse interface and fluctuating hydrodynamics, let me say coupled with, uh, with the rare event techniques seems to be very promising in doing so. And uh, for future work, we, we are trying to do some direct comparison with the experiments, for example, in uh, nitrogen boiling with Florian and, uh, and Matteo, and we are confident uh, that we are in the right direction. We are, we are finishing our code for fluctuating and dynamics for, for doing so. And uh, we are also working on the extension of the model for including uh, dissolved gases. There is, let's say, the, um, uh, the deterministic theory, so the multiphase uh, flow theory without noise that has been done by, for example, Professor Benilov or uh, Professor Gomez, and experiments with Marco Marengo and uh, Tasos and Joel. Uh, another possible, uh, I, I have the, this point two times, sorry. Another possibility is to include the roughness uh, of the surface with fractals. And we are doing in this direction with the help of Matteo Bottacchiari and uh, Maria Lancia that are uh, experts in uh, fractal analysis. We can include also surfactant in the, in the model and we are also playing with them. And finally, uh, non the extension of non-equilibrium te techniques uh, on, the, uh, on the, let's say, boiling in this case, but most in general nucleation with larger the, the, the division theory. And let me say that this is my secret dream. Okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. Mirko, thank you very much for, for this talk. Uh, for all the audience, feel, feel free to um, turn on your camera and um, uh, you know ask your question. Uh, while we wait for the first uh, question, I have to make a joke, if you allow me. I think uh, we can um, formally award you with the most equation in a TTC talk uh, ever. I think by far oh. you uh, deserve this award. Uh, at Thank this you. point, if there are, if there are any uh, questions from the audience, I will be uh, glad to um, give the floor to the participants. Otherwise, I can uh, I can start uh, with uh, with a quick question myself. Um, let me count to ten at least. <clears throat> okay, I don't see I don't see questions from the audience. So let me let me. Uh, let me ask you a philosophical question, okay? We have yeah. seen this beautiful machinery and uh, I admit uh, I couldn't follow all the all the steps, uh, but um, something which uh, I think it would be useful for, uh, for me, for the audience to understand is what currently are the limitations in terms of what you can or cannot uh, study because of the limit in the theory or because of computational limitations. And that means basically fluids type and surfaces and 
uh, chemical and uh, physical uh, heterogeneity and so on. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me start from the, the main limitation of the of the model is the computational limitation because uh, let's say as I said with the state of art of GPU accelerated codes we are able to simulate let's say one cube that has ten microns of length and this is one uh, one limitation so uh, the strictly speaking uh, the possibility of extending this kind of model to let's say to the proper micro scale that is the one for example of volume of fluids and so on it's very far from being achieved to be honest because we have let's say uh, there is uh, the metal scale is in between molecular dynamics and let's and let's say in microscopic hydrodynamics so we are in the medium and we can describe very well the let's say the scale of migrants on uh, on these time scales that are let's say tens of uh, microseconds we can do something better with rare event techniques. So in principle, the problem of time can be, let's say, surmounted by using rare event techniques. But currently, the problem of space needs modeling. So brute force simulation cannot be directly applied to the macroscopic world. But we can play, for example, with Voronoi oscillation and this kind of, of, of stuff to try to transfer uh micro meso scale information to volume of fluids for example or let's say to microscopic hydrodynamics i, I don't want to cite only my volume of fluid but this is just an example and uh okay there is also a, a, another problem that is not a problem at all but i mean uh probably this is the the less relevant that is we are only one free, uh, let's say, not parameter, but free function in, in, in our model, that is the equation of state. So the more the equation of state is precise, the more our results are precise. And let's say that there are a, a very good effort in, in this period to characterize fluids very well from an experimental point of view. For example, uh, for your experiment, uh, I played a lot with uh, cryogenics. And it seems that the equation of state for cryogenic with some, let's say, uh, diffuse interface manipulation are uh, very precise. And we are very confident that we, at least for cryogenics, we can play with them. And there is also another problem that concerns, let's say, complex geometries, in which dealing with complex geometries with stochastic fluid mechanics is a jungle because uh, numerical schemes are very delicate because we need to preserve uh, some statistical problem in the in the statistical schemes and for complex geometry this is very difficult we are trying to do something with the uh, finite elements we are confident that they could be uh, a, a nice opportunity but we got to study a lot on this point Thank you very much, uh, Mirko. Any any question from the audience or the? I think I have Cheng Mao. Uh, Cheng Mao, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. And nice to see you. Nice to see you, awesome, Matteo. Um, thank you very much for the talk. So I guess maybe related to the limit, I, I see the study is a lot um, or a lot of them focused on the onset of nucleation or maybe like a few nanoseconds after that. So how applicable is this approach to if I want to say replicate further like uh, from the nucleation event but towards like the um, where you, the typical heat transfer curve because um, theoretically there do doesn't seem to be anything stands between the onset and the subsequent event and uh, um, would like to hear your comment on this. Yeah, this is this is a, a very good point, and uh, I mean this is uh, also related to the first question of Matteo. I mean this is uh, more or less since this is a mesoscale model. Uh, I think that he well described the mesoscales. So uh, in principle, we can try to let's say uh, transfer these mesoscale quantities to the macro scale, but the direct applicability is very difficult. 
but not because the equations are more or less the same. So if, if we are going up with the scale, the noise uh, does not play a relevant role, and we end up with the simple Navier-Stokes equations. So the convergence of diffuse interface Navier-Stokes equation towards VUF description is very simple to be achieved. But the problem is, is with the computational cost because we need to solve the interface. So our grid spacing is always on the nanometric scales. And so if you want to simulate, let's say, one uh, millimeters, you need to have uh, 10 to the power 6 to the power 3 points. And this is not possible. So we have to play with modeling to transfer mesoscale information to macro scale. And I am quite confident that this can be done with bicoupling of fluctuating aerodynamics and rare event techniques. But at the end of the day, we should use macroscopic solver to describe macroscopic hydrodynamics. This just, let's say, a, a proper instrument to characterize uh, at the fundamental level uh, nucleation and phase transition. Okay, understood. So if I can, uh, one maybe off topic question. Uh, on page 13 in your toy model, like you have this two valley shape of the like potential. Um, like, is there a particular reason that you? draw the, the energy yeah. landscape that way like uh because typically like if, if i imagine the gibbs free energy looks something different but um yeah 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 for sure so uh let me this is a toy model so if we want to compare this energy landscape with the one of the bubble this is very similar to the elmos free energy in a constrained system in with the mass of the system is comparable with the mass of the bubble. So you have a stable bubble inside, okay? That is this position here. But if you play with the Gibbs free energy, you have one minimum here, and the energy is something like that. So there is no other one. The, okay, you have the energy barrier, and then in the Gibbs ensemble, this guy is a monotonic function because the, the stable state is the complete vapor. Okay. 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 You can talk offline because I feel like if it, for a two value system, there seem to be a lot of uh, like rare events or uh, interesting effects, like going from high temperature to low temperature, depending on how fast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but thank you. For sure. Chaimo, okay. uh, thank you for your question. I think uh, Vadim wants to ask a question. Uh, yes. Guess. Yes. Um, so uh, it, just to, to understand what you have done. Um, you, you you speak about um some some this functional that you that you work with that um and and you it seems like you you have there only the the gradients of density right uh, as as a um, okay uh, I I remember um there was a lot of work of Akira Onuki I don't know if his name tells something to you he uh, wrote some papers in the um, end of nineties, beginning of, of two thousands, and and the book on 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 that and uh, his functionals contained also um, a the the uh, fluxes on interface so uh, phase exchange so it it introduces an additional um, uh, you know out of equilibrium uh, deviation. So, um, but so your functionals look strange to me because they don't have uh, this contribution. That's the first thing. Uh, the, the second uh, thing is uh, 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 just to understand your your your, your setup. Uh, you speak about average temperature, so you you your. Uh, surface boiling surface was not isothermal or what how you introduced the the did you simulate the solid the temperature in solid or what how you introduced the heterogeneity of, of the surface temperature okay 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 so so second seconds question is just was just to to understand uh, Okay, thank you very much for your uh, for your question. So let me start from the second question that is easier. Yes. And let me let me show you the the screen. 
okay because uh, i have applied with the definition of the mean temperature okay just a moment yeah okay so basically since we are imposing the the, the heat flux on the wall we are not you solving the heat flux okay yeah we are not solving the uh, okay, let's say the heat, heat transfer in the solids so for us, solid is a boundary condition, but in principle, we, we can do something with the conjugated heat okay. transfer. So you, you impose the heat flux. This this explains uh, how you define the yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the function that I was reporting in the in the slides is the mean value of the temperature of the wall. So I sum okay. all the values of the temperature on the wall, and uh, this is uh, this is the renormalization. So this guy is okay. zero. Yeah. But okay. it, you know, uh, it means that um, okay, uh, if uh, the, this uh, graph, uh, for instance, <laughs> it means that your spinnadels are mean field, right? You, so you take yeah. the, the mean field uh, approximation for spinnadels. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the okay. mean field approximation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So. So uh, this is, uh, let's say, the Van der Waals also the Van der Waals equation of state. So it's mean field at all. Sure. Okay. And concerning your first question, uh, let me be honest. I, I don't know the 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 work you you were mentioning before. Okay. It's uh, uh, you. You should have a look because uh, th there were uh, several papers in Physical Review E, and in, I think um, most of them were there. Um, anyway, uh, there was. A, big uh, book of, of him on this subject so yeah uh, he simulated boiling and um <coughs> uh he had he made a lot of work on it so yeah, yeah thank you very much for the suggestion if you could please bribe me the the title in the chat or some uh, references uh, uh i will study this uh this papers because it seems to be very interesting because we we have not this kind of uh, of effect at least in the free energy but in some sense, we have that in the, let's say, in the extension to hydrodynamics, because if you look at the, at the heat flux, for example, here, at this, this is the, the energy flux, and we have something that is related to the gradient of the density and to the divergence of the velocity. I, I don't know if this could be similar, because... Uh, yeah, if you take the equation uh, of motion and you isolate one piece of fluids, you end up with these typical fluxes that have also memory of the, let's say, of the density structure in the in the fields. I don't know if this could be the same. Uh, but okay, but okay, I I just uh, urge you to 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 see his work because uh, it adds. Some some additional um, insight into uh, this problem. So um, I will put um, this into uh, his uh, uh, research gate um, page into the chat. Okay. Thank thank you. I will let you write this paper. Okay, uh, Vadim. Thank you for your question. Uh, we are certainly a little bit beyond uh, uh, time. Um, we have a question in the in the chat from Casper. Uh, in the interest of time, Mirko, would you mind sharing on the screen your email address so that uh, people can also email you a question after the, the talk? Oh, sure. Um, Let me well, write the email and then... I... Yeah, or on the chat if you wish. Uh, Casper cannot uh, speak is in a, in a say noisy environment, but very quickly, if you can answer his question, uh, the question is, uh, uh, if, if say, let me let me rephrase this very quickly. If I correctly understand, you represent your thermal noise as being white, uh, yeah. frequency independent. Okay, and Casper um, uh, is asking whether you have studied uh, or let me say considered a color noise in your FHT and uh, if you have an expectation on how this may affect uh, the nucleation rate. Please uh, try to keep your answer short and maybe follow up with Gaston. Yeah, yeah, and but uh, in order to answer, I, I need to precise that. Uh, so are you referring to time of space? Because it could be different. Okay. It's, it, as I said, it's unfortunately, um, 
is I don't think he's uh, listening or being connected as is as is say uh, time actually the answer is time. Ah, okay. So uh, I think that it does not play a relevant role because there is a, a separation time scale between hydrodynamics and uh, let's say thermal fluctuations. But I, I never tried to use colored noise because uh, there are some attempts in the generalized Langevin equation, but the equation are integral. And so, and we, we don't know the, the structure of the memory kernel. Okay. All right, I have the very last question since it's Paolo asking, I have to, I have to <laughs> take it. <laughs> Paolo, <laughs> how are you? Yes, uh, thank you, Mick, because uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I will try to understand it in the future, <laughs> but so far I just got something to, to be honest. My, my question is uh, uh, this one. You say that uh, nucleation starts from a uh, hydrophobic patch on the surface. Uh, how do we intend this hydrophobic patch? Is, uh, is this a random uh, fluctuation or is it a characteristic of the surface? No, this is a characteristic of the surface in terms of the macroscopic contact angle. Okay. And uh, yeah, be, be, because I, I mean, we are we are able to impose the the energy on the wall, and when you have a bubble, this energy fixes a sort of contact angle. But we have a, a diffusive interface, so it's it's not so. So, easy. so in some sense, uh, what, what I mean is, in some sense, it replaces the nucleation site. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Effect. Exactly that, because uh, we can recognize a nucleation site as one zone that has lower nucleation energy. And if we evaluate the barrier on this, let's say, putative uh, hydrophobic surfaces, we end up with a lower barrier. Okay. But for us, ju 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 just to, to conclude, uh, hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity is the changing in affinity of liquid and solids. It's better because it's a... Uh... Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Paolo. Uh, thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Mirko, again. And thank you all for this really amazing session. Uh, if you want to keep thinking about those equations, the video will be shortly posted on YouTube. So you'll have all the time um, to uh, you know, uh, make the mathematical derivation. Uh, for today, uh, we have to unfortunately close it here. And uh, well, thank you again. And uh, I hope to see you all soon uh, in another talk.